that was an extremely detailed uh, view uh, for, the, for the statutes of that. Um, and that's it's kind of why I asked the question. Um, you know, I, I understand we're a public entity and um, I'm, I'm kind of pulled both ways. I, I really want to, you know, hold our, our trade secrets as close to, as close to the chest as possible. Um, at the same time, I, 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 I'm looking at this from a PR perspective. Um, you know, depending on who's requesting this data, um, you know, and if they do decide to, you know, to you know, say that, you know, they, they don't believe that the redacted data is something that we can redact and, and they do decide to go against us on that, how does that, how does that make us look in our community's eyes? So it's just something that I think we've got to really be careful about how we do this. Um, and that's, that's, that's the point that I, that I wanted to make. Okay. It's, it's it. You know, it's one of the burdens that a public agency carries. Uh, believe me, public agencies struggle with that very question all the time, and it's difficult. But I think if you d really do believe that if by giving out the information, you're putting a public agency at a disadvantage that could harm the people that you're representing and could endanger the project that you've more or less been charged to carry out, uh, I think you have the responsibility actually to do what you think is the right thing. Okay, so on my list of people interested in talking, I have Michael, then Jeremy, then Jerry, then Greg. So Michael and Siobhan. Um, I understand what David's saying and, and, and I appreciate that quite a bit. I think that it's a difficult situation to be withholding any information from the people we represent and um we do to the greatest extent possible want to share our information with the citizen group um having said that and you know what that means <laughs> um i do strongly believe that sharing the information in this report puts us at um, not even theoretical or subtle risk, a great risk. Um, it's, there are a number of unknown competitors and likely competitors tremendously be, take advantage of knowing our strategy, our tactics, our choice of locations, um, what we think of them. We, I mean, all lots of different entities are described in our report. Um, and on top of that, the costs, that's one of the most important things. If, if we enter into auctions with, uh, with competitors and they know what we project our costs to be, they know when when they've gotten us to a point where we can't go any farther. So there are so many different subtle ways that the information in this report can lead to our detriment that we could end up having um, companies um, defensively um, shoving us to the side just to protect their turf, let alone steal our potential customers. That that. I feel really strongly that despite our need to report to the public, we have to protect our competitive information. Now, what do we do about it? We could say the whole report's off limits, and that would be probably simpler um, because there are so many aspects in here. That if we do choose, let's say we pick a committee, or let's say the project committee does the redactions. It, it could look like something coming out of the Department of Defense. It could have so many redactions in it that it would be offensive to see. And, and it may be more appropriate to just say, you know, there's, only, there's hardly anything in here we could share publicly, and we're going to withhold the whole document. I'm not sure about that stuff. I've never been involved in a public agency before. That's why I always make all these mistakes about public records. And, Fortunately, we have people like Alan who can straighten me out. But um, there was, we've had a little behind the scenes discussion of this in advance of today's board meeting. And I think 
the idea of getting an opinion, even though Alan's not an attorney, but he really knows this stuff. He's been dealing with it for decades. But I think we should get a legal opinion. And I don't think it would take long to get a legal opinion, particularly if um, our previous delegate from Marshfield, Jim Barlow, is available. I'm sure he's glad to help us. Um, so I, rec I would like to make a motion that we ask Jim Barlow his opinion of whether we should redact it or withhold it. And what, what does he believe the prospects of our losing in court if it was challenged? And that would help guide us whether whether we're concerned about the penalty phase and so forth. But Jeremy, can can I just make a point of information so that you understand this? Michael, you can't do what you suggested. You can't say, well, so much of this information is confidential. We're just going to withhold the whole thing. There's actually a specific part of the public records law that says you have to make an effort that if any part of a document does not contain public information that you think can be withheld, you have to release that. You can't. Yeah. Police are famous for doing this, you know. They say, oh, sorry, you can't sorry, have any of this. Sorry to interrupt. There's, there's someone who yeah. really is, I, I just, I just is, is, is harmless. Um, so there actually is a provision now in the the state public records law that says you can't do what you just suggested. So I don't want to disappoint you, but you right, know well, that's the, what it is. The only, the only thing that you've taken away from my request is the choice between redacting it or withholding the whole thing. I still think that we should get the legal opinion and um, and perhaps the legal opinion would say you should withhold the whole document, not because there are the, the subtleties that you described, but just that the whole document really is proprietary. Um, so I would appreciate having a legal opinion on that. Um, Can I just say to put on the record, Jeremy, I'm not an attorney. I'm not offering legal advice. I don't want to get I don't want to get the AG come after me for practicing law. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just offering what I know about the public records law. <clears throat> I, I'm not an attorney. Okay. Thank, thank you very much for that, Alan. Um, so I'm adding. Um, uh, all right. So next is Jeremy. Yeah, I mean, Michael kind of covered a lot of it. It just seems like just just with the maps alone and the first route that we go after someone could say all right i'm going to build right in the middle of that and you know screw up that whole route for us then suddenly our whole business plan isn't feasible anymore you know because we've wasted all this money planning and they've you know built a little patch of cable right where we want to run through um the other question that i have is in terms of talking to select boards and stuff like that is it possible that we could um, say, well, it's all sensitive now, and then when we need to have discussions with public entities about specific pieces, say, well, we need to talk about this now. We think that at this point, we're far enough along in the process that it no longer puts us at a, public, at a disadvantage. This is now no longer considered uh, sensitive. So I guess that, that was my question. That is, that's, you, Jamie, that is I, excuse me, I, I meant to say that, and I'm so glad you did, Jeremy, because that I do believe that at some point we won't have a problem saying, hey, Callus, we're coming, sign up, but it doesn't have to be now. Yeah, so so that would be this board's decision about um, at what point we would be willing to to release it or not. I mean, it's in, in fact, you know, the board's decision tonight could be that we're going to make it all public tonight, or we could decide, you know, once the fiber is on the poles, that we'll then be talking about it, or somewhere in between. Um, so that that's that's what I'm hoping for us to get to uh, tonight. So um, I'd like to second Michael's motion to uh, have the board consult an attorney on some of the specifics of this. I think a lot of the questions we're delving into require uh, somebody who, who can practice and, and who knows this material. Does that does that work with the timeline that we have? Two more days? Um, maybe if I can get him on the phone quickly. Um, the, the question that I have for all of you is, are you willing to spend some money? Because 
you know, attorneys don't necessarily do this for free. Can we complete discussion on this first? Uh, well, so so yeah, this we, is, yeah. So, so so there's a there's a motion on on the table right now. There's a motion on the table that we should reach out to Jim Barlow to get a legal opinion on this. And this this is the discussion about that. So I can go to Jim Barlow and say, Hey Jim, can you do us a favor and let me know? Um, let me know what you think. Or, or he might say. You know, this is these are billable hours. So I think given Alan's sorry. feedback, the the point I would make on that second of the motion is that I would personally be in favor of going down the path of redacting. However, um, uh, I would want the legal guidance to the the committee around what exactly could constitute something that is redactable or not. Um, and and Michael, correct me if that was not in the spirit of what you were motioning. Um, I would like to ask him both questions. Uh, it, would he find it acceptable to deny the entire request or redact it? And I'm open to hearing the answer to either one. Okay. All right, so still talking with the motion, Phil, and then Andy, and uh, then Ken. Jeremy, you yeah. forgot me. Uh, so, well, okay, so I, I, I didn't know if you still wanted to talk about this or if you wanted to get in the queue for uh, after the motion. Uh, well, e either way, I okay. just, I have a problem with the fundamental premise. Whenever you think is a good time, just cue me in. Oh, so, so this is, yeah, so if you have something to add about the question about asking Jim Barlow, um, then, I mean, so that's the the item on the floor right now. I'm happy to come back to you. I'm happy to have you talk now or when we're done, whichever you'd prefer. Well, let me do it now then, since okay. I have the opportunity. Sure. Uh, so I disagree with the fundamental premise here, and I'm actually concerned about exactly what we're doing because this is a distraction from a road that we've been on and, and working very hard to move forward. And I see this whole thing as a distraction. Uh, there really aren't trade secrets that we have in this feasibility study. Any, uh, one of the things that I've, that I've learned in being a part of all of this analysis is anybody that knows this industry would probably have come up with something almost exactly as we have laid out. There, there are only so many logical and reasonable paths to move forward in providing a 100-100 service or as close as you can get to it. So anybody that would spend the time and effort, and if you know the industry, if you are the industry, considering if you're consolidated or Comcast, none of this is new to you. They would have been surprised had we come up with another alternative. They know we're a CUD, they know what our purpose is, they know what our towns are, and they know we're going for money that everybody else is going for. So there's, there's nothing here that's a surprise. There's really nothing here that's a secret. Uh, there is some NDA, uh, non-disclosure information, I believe, about some of the technology we looked at, but that's a sidebar. And I, I, I really think this is distracting us from our main purpose. And I don't, I, I don't think we would be any worse if we put all of this information that we have on the internet, on our on our website tonight. I don't think we would be any the worse for it. Um, it's no surprise to anybody what we're planning on doing and how we're planning on going about it. Um, so that's my piece, I'm done. Great. Thanks, Jerry. I've got Phil, then Andy, then Ken. Uh, thanks, uh, Jerry. My, my comment goes um, to the Jim Barlow issue. Um, I think it would be unfair of us to ask Jim to do this um, unless we retain him as counsel. I think there's a liability issue for him. Um, I think if I were in his shoes, I, would, I wouldn't I would want to just do this um, unless I was hired as counsel or retained as counsel to offer an opinion. Um, that being said, you know, that's would be a fine way to go. The other is, is this a question we could put before Paul Giuliani? 
Um, Paul's had a lot of experience working with EC fiber and has undoubtedly um, addressed some of these issues with them and may have a, um, a really quick answer to this. Okay, uh, Andy? Yeah, so speaking directly to the motion, I, I would vote no against it for some of the reasons Phil outlined and also because I think it's premature and that it's really up to the board to make the decision first about whether we want to publicly disclose or not. Um, and then I can either come back if we go to the more general discussion or I can just say Dave and Jerry are winning me over in a big way. Um, I, I just don't see that realistically this is a competitive threat to us and it's better for us to communicate. Okay, I've got uh, Ken, Michael, David, Siobhan. So with regards to the motion, I too would not suggest we go to a lawyer at this point. Um, uh, and I'll say it, and and that is, the. I would also not suggest we pursue, if, if indeed our decision is challenged to a point of taking it to a court, then I would come back before the board and, and release the document, to be quite honest, because I don't want to go down that path. But, but, and in part, my, this is on my overall sentiment about, about this decision. I don't, it, it isn't that big a deal to me. I do think there is some competitive disadvantage, and I'll use the specific example, is I, I can't remember who it was, that, that by knowing this is where we may go first, they, uh, a, a particular cable company could screw us up. And it would not be a path they would normally take because they may not make money at it, but they'd screw us up. And and then that we I think we have the belief that there is, this is a competitive world, and the extent to which we are successful will be chopping into the the business activity of the large competitors. Now, I, but I also know this only gives us the, the time between now and when we actually make the decision to move forward is only a few months. That's why I'm not that worried about it. But it isn't public information that does not, it, it puts us at a competitive disadvantage. I think that is clear. And whether we can avoid it or not in the long term, I don't know, because we are gonna have to make it public. But anyway, for that reason, I don't wanna go to a lawyer. I don't wanna spend the money and take the time. Uh, group here says, oh, just release the whole thing. I, that won't bother me, because to me, it's just buying a few months. Okay, so um, I previously had Greg and Siobhan in the queue for the previous discussion, but do you wanna, um, so Greg, why don't you weigh in um, if you, because everybody's sort of, we're, we're kind of going back to the bigger question as we're, as we're dealing with the, uh, the motion on the floor, but yeah, it's yours. Okay, so uh, there is a, a variety of information that was sourced from other parties, and if to, whether we're going to release it in whole, or redacted, we need to have approval of all the other sources of that information. Uh, it, it may be maps, and, and even if it's not under NDA, we should still get approval to uh, disclose. And then second, there is a competitive issue, and it's something that I have been on both sides of. Uh, if you have knowledge of a competitor may be going in a certain route, you try to go ahead of them and license the poles, even if you have no intention of providing service in that area, but it drives up their cost. So I'm not saying that would happen to CUDs, and these territories that CUDs have aren't that valuable. Uh, that's why nobody's built, but, um, but it is a very real thing, and I've been on both sides. I've done it, and I've been a uh, victim of it. So uh, people will just license the poles and never build just to drive up your cost. So for that reason, I would want to redact you know, maps, routes, costs, because uh, you don't know who's going to uh, use it in which way, in what way. So. Okay, so I've got Siobhan, Michael, and David. One of the points I wanted to make that I haven't heard made yet um, is uh, so I agree that it's premature to ask for a lawyer right now. Um, I think that we're capable of making this decision, and if somebody pushes back on it, then maybe we talk to a lawyer to confirm we're on solid ground. But I really don't think we're going to have a big problem with that. 
but the point that I wanted to make is the world we're in right now is different than the world we were in when we commissioned this feasibility study and when we started this work. There's federal money, there's state money, and there's going to be a flood of people trying to get that money. And we're going to be competing with them in this. And I think that that few months of edge is going to make a difference to us because we're a teeny little organization trying to make our way here. And so the difference of $100,000 is huge to us is not going to be a big deal to some other company that's just trying to edge us out because they're philosophically opposed to the idea of CUDs. And so they're just going to try and make it as hard for us as they can. And every piece of information they can get to use against us for that purpose is to our detriment. And I think it's worth protecting our information for a period of time. Now, I too also would rather just release it to everybody, but I don't trust everybody anymore. And, and, and eventually in time, yeah, but right now, because of all of the money that's coming in with the CARES Act and the federal money and the rural development money and all of the competitive stuff that's going on surrounding this and everybody trying to get a piece of that pie, I don't think we should risk laying our cards out too soon. And I'm done. Okay, uh, Michael and David, and then I think we should probably uh, get to a vote on this and then we can go back to the, the bigger question. So, Michael? Okay, um, Siobhan hit it pretty well there. The, the issue isn't, the only thing I don't agree with that Siobhan said was uh, they may philosophically not like the idea of CUDs and they might want to just muck things up for us. I don't think that's the point. I think the point is that because there is so much money floating out there, that these poor business case locations that no one would build to have suddenly with the subsidies become wonderful business case locations. And they're attractive to these big companies um, because someone's gonna pay them to do something that they might have been made to do by, by the regulators. Now they get paid to do it. And, and it's very attractive to them. Um, and I wanna reiterate, most of this, the biggest money is going to come through in an auction. And if I'm in an auction and I know who I'm bidding against, and I know how much money they have in their wallet, I know how far to go in the auction to win, if I can afford it. I don't want them to know what we think it's going to cost us. It's, it's just a real advantage to them in the bidding process. And this RDOF bid, um, reverse auction. I don't know how the state's reverse auction, if it ever comes to pass, how that will be run. But I've been through a few webinars now about how RDOF and CAP2 were run. It's really sophisticated. It's not a simple thing like, oh, you did this, then someone bids a little lower. There's all kinds of calculations going on all the time. And um, I can't, I don't want to take me through it now, but this kind of intelligence is extremely valuable to someone who's bidding. Now, regarding the, the lawyer, I'm willing to back down on the need for the lawyer. Um, I trust the non-legal advice we've heard tonight. And um, I think that we, we probably are safe with it and we will not sue whoever imparted it to us as having misled us. So. I would be comfortable with the redaction process and not, not withholding the whole thing and go through a redaction process. And, and I think that's sort of a middle ground. Um, I'm just not ready to release this information to the public. Later, sure, maybe, but not now. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, David and then Jeremy, I'm gonna give you the last word and then we'll we'll get on with this my comments on the lawyer and one of the things if i'm not ready to hire a lawyer but if we do start to think about a lawyer i think we ought to seriously think about mr giuliani because he's representing an ek cud and he's representing ec fiber we might as well all team together anyway that's my point all right jeremy uh see if i can unmute um yeah so i mean i i'm just trying to like put myself my myself in like a public shoes like 
would I think it was strange if we said, you know, if, if I was curious, like where is CV fiber going? And they said, well, we're not going to tell you the exact routes. Here's the stuff redacted. And I, I just, I don't see myself or my neighbors getting upset if I said, well, I can't tell you exactly where the routes are. You know, <laughs> they're in our member towns. I, I just, I don't see that that's going to be a public relations nightmare for us. Um, and that's all that I had to say. Okay. Can I, can I throw one, one tiny thing in? There's a of real course. difference between these. I'm sorry to trump in there like that, but there's a real difference between EC Fiber and all the other CUDs in that they have Valinet as their shield. And none of the rest of the CUDs have an entity as a shield like they do. EC Fiber owns the plant. Valinet makes all the plans and decisions, and they're private, and nobody can request their records. Okay, so uh, we have a motion to uh, ask Jim Barlow to give a legal opinion on whether it's acceptable to deny um, the public records request or to redact the material before it's submitted or before it's uh, turned over. Um, that was moved and seconded. Um, because we are going to have, um, it's because it sounds like we will not have consensus, let's do. Um, Let's do a roll call. So, um, Alan, uh, y y y yes or no on the motion? I think John Russell oh, is there oh, and is voting oh, for what? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, you're, you're right. Well, let me go alphabetically and see if I can remember who's. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, you can go back to me if John's left, but <clears throat> no. otherwise, I think it's John. John's still here, but my unfortunately, my interface is uh, my interface to go to meeting is being strange. Um, okay, so uh, Andy? Uh, no. Okay, uh, Chuck? Nay. David? No. Greg? No. Uh, let's see. Uh, John, I'm, I'm having a difficulty with, with my go to meeting. If you can post your vote. Nay. In... Nay. Oh. oh, okay, great. It worked. I was able to unmute you. No, okay. I did it. All right. Uh, Josh? Uh, no. Ken? No. Michael? I'm sorry I didn't withdraw the motion to save us a little time. It's no. okay. Come on. <laughs> No. Okay, uh, Phil? No. Ray? No. Uh, Tom? No. Trev? No. Oh, well, so I will join the crowd and I will say no, and the, the motion is defeated. So wh where would you like to go from here? Uh, did you get Jerry? Jerry is an alternate. Ah, right. So. I will move. Oh, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, I'll move that we instruct um, Jeremy to convene the appropriate individuals to go through a process to redact the document so that it can be delivered in a redacted form um, to the person making the information request. Okay. I second. Second. Okay. So uh, that's instructing. Second. Inst Who's second? I missed the second. I second, Greg. Okay. Th Greg. Thanks, Greg. So that's to instruct me to convene a redaction committee for the purpose of um, reviewing the feasibility study and redacting those parts that we deem uh, trade secrets under Vermont law uh, in advance of, of releasing it. Does that sound like a reasonable thank thank you for phrasing it okay okay any uh any further discussion on this okay here oh, here we got uh, in siobhan siobhan's um recommend their her comments 
um, I think they were pretty appropriate for uh, consideration for what, what to reveal and what not to reveal. Okay. Do, uh, do, do we want to change the, the motion to, I mean, are you looking to amend? Okay, we'll, we'll try to keep that in mind. Did you have something to add, Jeremy? I saw your hand up. And if the emotion did, yeah, if, if it just, if the motion did include, or if, if the intent was to include um, what is being redacted or if that is going to be up to the redaction. Are, 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 are we leaving that up to the redaction committee as I'm saying it offhandedly? Yeah, that was my understanding. Okay, uh, David, you have something? Yeah, I, I have a concern. I think this is probably gonna pass, but. I have uh, in my later agenda item, uh, people who are interested in the RDOF and the ISP, I need to follow up with them. And one of the documents they go on to talk to us about is the feasibility study. So did they get an NDA they have to sign to get the document? That is a yes. really good question. So can, can we ask those folks that are interested in this and, and that are going to be potentially providing services to us to sign an NDA? Does that seem like like a reasonable move forward? Yes, and because yeah. they're in the they're in the business, uh, yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Do we I, already have a template for mutual NDA, or are we going to need a subsequent motion for some lawyering on that? Uh, There's got to be out there. Yeah, I I I don't I don't know that we need a motion for that. I I think that's that's enough of the uh, kind of process that unless somebody has objections I'm gonna I think we can just leave it up to David to uh, to drive that uh, Jeremy what do you got I guess this is maybe a question for Alan um, does the board need to find that things are uh, trade secrets before they can be redacted or can that be offloaded to a committee no, I think you can offload that to a committee and remember Jeremy supposedly is going to respond to the person who requested the record, and then that person has five days to uh, to file an appeal, um, and then whoever the head of our agency is has five days to respond to the appeal. So there's still some time running here where you could have second thoughts uh, and fine tune things and whatnot. But I. I think that's where the idea of, of working with somebody like Peter Giuliani is a good idea to give give you the parameters of of what makes sense and what doesn't and when you have to get it done by. Thanks. Okay, Andy. Yeah, I just want to since we're back to the general question, reiterate some of my concern with and just echoing what Jerry Jeremy TD said that we're getting way off the rails with this. Our mission isn't to be a company. Our mission isn't to be competitive. Our mission is to solve this broadband problem. And if we incent somebody to go out there and build because they're afraid of us, because there's all this federal money there, I don't know that that's the end of the world. And it's just our existence, which has already driven a lot of both the legislative interests and everything else. So I, I think we're a little captive to being too much probably industry experts. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want that to sound wrong, but we're not, we're a public body. We're, we're here really to ensure that we serve our constituents with, you know, a proper service. We're not here to win a competition. Okay, I have uh, Michael and Jeremy and let's, um, let's, if we can, hopefully, if you have something n new to add, I mean, we can obviously hear the same arguments. I mean, not, you know, pointy fingers or anything, but I think, in the interest of time, uh, now that we have Fred and Dan here, it would be, be good to actually get to that feasibility study. Uh, Michael? Uh, so one comment I have is that the the final draft isn't quite final. We we have some things we'd like to see changed in it, and um, we may be able to change them within our three-day window, and it would be preferable um, to the extent that it's not the parts that aren't redacted are as close to the final as possible because it is that stuff will get into the public sphere so why not i realize that's a tall order in a short period of time but i think it's achievable so i recommend that we try to refine the draft as much as we can before we um, submit it in a redacted form 
Okay, so I have uh, Jeremy, then Tom. Uh, so I just, I don't agree with, with you, Andy, sorry. Um, it seems to me that, yes, we're, we're, not, we're not out there to make a profit, but we do need to be competitive in that there are other entities that would be going after the money that Siobhan talked about. And we could very well find ourselves in a position where, you know, some entity comes in, builds a little bit of an area that is more profitable for them, again, like has been happening all along with all the cable companies. And then we find that it isn't feasible to reach these last few people. I mean, like, I don't, I mean, it just seems like it could make it harder for us to achieve our mission if we are, if we give up competitive advantage, even though, yes, we're a public company, we still need to compete with private entities in that we're going after the same money as them, we're going after the same customers as them. So that's all that I wanted to say. Okay, and uh, Tom? Uh, just a question on that, you know, draft versus final form. What is the specific request that came in? Um, I can read it to you if you give me a moment. Um, request the inter aisle deliverables. Which the deliverable would seem to be the final draft, right? Um, well, I mean, yeah. they're, they're, they're delivering. I I'm, it's, it, I, I don't think it's worthwhile mince, mincing words or arguing about whether they mean the final draft or whatever. I mean, the, the intent was to review the materials that we are talking about tonight here. Um, that was, I mean, there, there is more in the email than just that. that there's that, that's the simple part. And I'm, uh, I don't know where that is coming from. Is that your side, Tom? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, there there is more to the email than that, but I mean, the, but the the punchline is requesting the inter aisle deliverables, which my reading was the materials that we're reviewing the inter aisle delivered to us that we are reviewing for tonight. That doesn't half make me feel watched at all. Well, we're we're public. We are necessarily yeah, I know, but... in the public eye. I we are the question. Okay. So, call, uh, so it, <laughs> uh, unless somebody else has any more comments, I think yeah. it, I will use kind of executive privilege to not call the question because that requires another vote, uh, and I don't oh, right. really want to do another yeah. vote. You're right. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So um, let me remind you of the motion on the floor was to instruct instruct me, Jeremy Hansen, to convene a redaction committee for the purposes of deciding what parts of the draft inter aisle feasibility study that should be redacted before being released as a public record to the requester. Okay, so let's go down our list again. Um, we will go with, um, we'll start with Andy. So I vote no. Okay, Chuck? Yes. Uh, David? No. Greg? Yes. Uh, let's see, John. John Russell. No. Okay, Josh. Sorry, no. Ken. Yes. Uh, Michael. Yes. Siobhan. Yes. Phil? Yes. Ray? Yes. Uh, Tom? No. Trev? Um, no. Okay, and um, I don't I don't need to vote. The yeses have it at seven to six. Um, the motion passes. I will I will take the, this is maybe the, the first motion that we have had in the history of this body that has been anything other than you know, unanimous, maybe minus one or two, so. Um, yeah, that's the closest vote we've had. Yep, yeah, so. Come I'm, on us. All I'm, right. So I hope everybody's still able to get together and when we are not 
you know, physically distancing, we can still have beers and talk to each other after this. So but <laughs> I will I will take the instructions of the board and we can um, hopefully proceed from here. Um, if you are all amenable, I think let's um, move up the conditional approval of the feasibility study that we've been talking about a bit because we have Fred and Dan here. Um, I think um, I think we've got something really awesome. It would be it would be great to try to get this out the door so we can move on to the next step. Uh, Jeremy, what do you got? Sorry, I just real quick, uh, if we're going to be discussing the feasibility study, uh, does the board want to consider going to executive session? Oh, only if we are going to be discussing parts of the feasibility study that require us to talk or read portions that would otherwise be subject to redaction, which I think what, what we came to, and what I was taking at, in my notes here was, if I can find my notes, um, any specific um, discussion of maps, specific descriptions of routes, geographic elements, any of the walkthroughs, or the specific financials. I'm not sure that our discussion will get there. I think this is more about things that we can um, improve in the final draft, things that are maybe being added um, in the, um, so I, I provided a draft um, set of things to perhaps correct or update in the, in the study. Um, if you have other things that need to be added or um, modified, I think we can talk about that. If you feel like there is something that we need to discuss and we need to go into executive session, um, we should talk about that first. There is obviously that process of going into that executive session. Thank you again, Alan, for that refresher of and those links to the, the statute on that as well. Um, but let's, let's see if we can uh, tiptoe a bit and not get to that material if we can manage it. Um, David, I would like to hand the reins over to you to sort of um, proceed from here, if that's okay. <laughs> sure. I, I mean, Jeremy and Jerry provided the, so we all provided comments on the draft when we met on Friday, and I don't have them in front of me, so that's why I had to go through them. But it's a list of the minor things and that thing. Okay, I, I muted you, uh, caller, so that because you had uh, you had yourself on speakerphone, it was creating some echo. So if you if anybody is listening to this and they would like to ask a question, you can feel free to text me 802-279-6054. I will unmute you and you can ask your question. So sorry about that, David. Go ahead. So we came up with a list of changes that we thought needed to be referenced in the report. Are updated in the report, including there was a missing a we found assessment part of the requirement in the RFP. Um, we, you know, from from our standpoint, the document was beyond what, we, what I was expecting in terms of quality, content, and methodology. Um, you can probably quibble with some of the information in terms of roots, but as far as I was concerned, I thought they put, put together a pretty credible document that we can take. To the next level in terms of doing a business document, a business plan, um, as well as used for some of our grant application work. Um, uh, I'd ask Jerry if he has any additional things that he wants to bring to the board's attention. I, everybody in the board got a copy. Um, I don't know if you got a copy of our comments. I think you did. Um, and if there are any questions about the comments or the report that you think you'd like um, interrail to improve upon, this is your opportunity, I think, because what the committee, the project team would like is to get a conditional approval tonight based on the fact that interrail will make the changes with us and we'll move on. But um, so that's sort of where the project team is. So I'll ask Jerry, I mean, he's, if he's got anything he wants to add to that. Uh, the only thing I would add uh, is that personally, uh, I'm very pleased with the report, and the the project team has gone gone through it uh, very closely. And you can tell from the comments, uh, folks at Inner Isle, you can tell from the comments that the they are marginal comments, uh, improvements that we can see a, a, a few additions, a more firm conclusion section. Um, we're providing an executive summary. Uh, I I'm I'm very pleased with the work and. That, that's all I'll add now. 
And Thank uh, you. and if I can just point out the um, the material that I that I sent to you, that it's a CVF addendum to May sixth draft. Um, there's some that's the commentary that the the project team put together for um, su suggestions for what what the final draft will look like. So um, reiterating what David's saying. Um, what we'd like to see at some point is if there's anything else that needs to be added to this, then we let's get this out of the way now. Um, and but otherwise, I'm hoping that we can make a motion to approve the um, to approve the feasibility study um, subject to the updates and changes suggested by the project team. And so. you haven't sent me your suggested total list of changes, uh, right? Oh wow, that's <laughs> Horrible if I didn't do that. I'm so, so sorry, Fred. Hold on. I'm gonna... Oh, my God, Jeremy. Oh. Here, so is see. that a motion, Jeremy, or are you hoping someone else will make the motion? Um, I wanted to talk about it a little bit first. Um, okay. Uh, just to see if everybody was on board. I mean, if that if that Jeremy. seems unreasonable. Jeremy, it's Michael. Go for it. Um, um... I think I remember you saying that you wanted to take some of the questions to Dan or someone else at EC Fiber. Um, were you able to do that? Um, I was. That so that I reflected in the document. It is not reflected in, in in the document because we had the we were going to have the discussion about to whom could we release our feasibility the feasibility study to. So um, once I get an okay. NDA. Once I get an NDA signed, then we can then we can talk together. So um, there may be some things that that are left slightly more open than we would like. But yes, I will um, I will work with um, EC Fiber to get um, an NDA in place so that I can send them that material as well. Thank you. Okay. Any other any other thoughts? Yeah. Right. Uh, so I, I had a question. The question had to do with um, I saw six groups, uh, but I didn't see in those groups. I didn't see Barry City. I didn't see Berlin. I didn't see uh, Elmore, either in the groups or in the maps. And uh, are they missing, or did I just not read it correctly? So I'm I'm gonna just remind everybody as much as possible again because these are portions that may be may be redacted that we should not talk too too much about it but um so uh dan or fred um your choice of the areas that we talked about net kind of don't include certain certain towns and i think um if there's some insight into your process that would be yeah sh should i address that now if you could yeah sure what we were doing, we weren't actually plotting out the final complete project. What we were doing was plotting out early phases of the project in order to. You've been muted. We needed to plot out uh, the a first stage of the project that could be used when. Uh, dealing with a limited funding. Remember, we started this without any of the emergency funding that might become available. So given limited funding and the need to get to, to break even relatively quickly, we addressed the areas that seem most promising because A, they were reaching people who were totally unserved or only had very limited DSL. Um, and B, you know, so we were, didn't want to overbuild cable more than incidentally in the first round, and also places that we could get to at a relatively easy cost with using the available Velco uh, backbone fiber to get to or WEC facilities. So in the case of Barry City, that's entirely served by cable. Most of Barry Town is served by cable. So it wasn't a priority to overbuild cable. It was to you know prove first that we're serving the unserved. That's <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we've never seen uh, people before. <laughs> so the um so so we had to you know put aside areas like Montpelier City and Barry City because those were cable they weren't 
the, the priority. Uh, in the case of Elmore, there literally was no easy way to get there because it's electric routing of the poles didn't connect to the rest of the area. So we're looking at it as something we want to get to, but we first have to figure out how we're going to get there. It might involve coming down from the north. Uh, they're coming in from the east, coming in from outside. But we, we, it, it's most of its electricity comes from, was it Hardwick Municipal? Um, and, and so it's 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 a different it's not on WEC or GMP it's a muni network uh, for the poles so it, it just was a little harder to to make the case with the early funding uh, that we could get there um, some of the others we just didn't get to filling in like there is in Burke we can get to pretty easily um, and there's some areas that we want to get to earlier with the wireless uh, we can build out wireless pretty quickly and reach some of the areas. Uh, West Elmore, which is the area um, that's really Morris, Morrisville, but in Elmore, um, that's already, you know, for, for what it's worth, that's already covered by VTEL, VTEL's network. VTEL has a silo there on there, so they're not as unserved as some of the other areas, um, which actually is, is good that that silo is there. Uh, as a tower, because it's on Morrisville Electric, which again is totally separate from all the rest of the district. So that's why we weren't trying to reach every last thing in every last phase. We were trying to basically plot out the first couple of phases that would really do the most on fiber while filling in other areas with wireless. Okay, so we were, we were um, okay, so I think I can understand that particular point. Where is financial sustainability uh, as part of the evaluation? The, the uh, of course, in the business plan part, we're going to go into more detail. I've been starting on the numbers, but those aren't finished yet. Basically, there's a fiber density that it's very expensive, you know, to reach people when they're not anybody per mile. So we were looking for an average of 10 per mile for these. What I call routes are really build clusters. They're logical build clusters that were there because they are something that would be built you know, as a project um, for financial reasons, but they're not set in stone at all. They're basically for financial modeling purposes. They can be changed, adjusted, added, subtracted. We wanted to say, if we built these, we have a, enough people in enough density to reach 10 per mile, 10 homes per mile, uh, that uh, some of the miles are higher, some of the miles are lower, but with the connectivity within the group, and there's some funny connectivity just because of where the poles are. We, we, we looked like these were feasible builds. Um, now that, that density, that, um, when, I, when I looked at this and I looked at the potential customers and the numbers, it appeared to me that those who were less than 25 megabits per second were motivated customers. People who would, they're underserved, there were four, there were 10, there were not 25. People who were 25 were potential customers. People who were already at 100 were unlikely customers. And it seems like if you just took the numbers of those less than 25, you'd come up with a different density model uh, per mile um, when I did the when I did the review of the different uh, groups, and so uh, this is why the sustainability. Uh, that's why I was asked the question about the sustainability. Well, you know, again, the we we actually, you know, tried to put together these builds that reflected as a group potential amounts of density. Um, there nothing final there. Um, but trying to make what look to be approximately a workable number, uh, which is that sort of around that 10 number. Uh, it, it, it's safe. We, we, we could certainly add and subtract places. That was a 10 number in the primarily underserved and unserved areas. Uh, if it was a cable area, we expect a lower take rate. Yeah. And actually, so in, the, in the numbers, the business plan numbers, I actually, when I'm working on likely take rate and therefore the cash flow 
areas with cable or something better um, get a lower initial take rate than the areas that are only slow DSL or nothing. Yeah. So when I looked at when I looked at those and I did the I crunched those numbers, um, blue came in at for the motivated customers those at less than twenty five at eight density per mile, and the purple came in at ten density per mile, and the next highest one was uh, yellow at nine density per mile. So I think that just looking at potential customers where it includes all 25 and 100, 100 is not an appropriate um, denominator for this particular analysis. Well, that's it. The, 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 the blue route has a section in the middle that uh, in order to get from Middlesex to Worcester, we have to go through that section. So we expect a lower take rate while crossing through that section. So, but frankly, can, can I interrupt it'll you be for interesting a second? to see what rate we get. So can I interrupt you for a second? Again, if we can avoid talking about specifics of routes and such. So I, I understand Ray's motivation here for drilling down about uh, why you made certain choices or the other. And um, I think to a certain extent, I'm going to trust Fred and his team to make the decisions that they're making about how they chose to do feasibility. I think if you want to share with them your your thoughts about you know specific um, metrics and methods offline when it comes or separate from this meeting when it comes to um, how we get to the business plan and the specific um, you know, cash flows and stuff and such. I, I think we still have a lot of time to decide those final routes, but I think if we use this, you know, use these as, uh, the, uh, as thumbnails for the various approaches that we could have, um, I think we're still looking at this from a, maybe not a 30,000 foot view, but maybe a 10,000 foot view, and that we're getting closer and closer to the ground and we're getting there soon. Um, so uh, we, we, could, we could spend, I think we could spend a lot of time um, picking nits as it were. And I, and I, I certainly don't, don't want to say that, that your, your criticisms or your suggestions are not, are not significant or not valuable, Ray. I just, I, I want to make sure that we're making the best use of our time uh, all t altogether here. So um, I would, would certainly ha hand the floor back over to Fred if there's anything else that you wanted to, to add about this. No, I'm just saying if we tried to go for a harder, you know, higher number, uh, by excluding some of the served areas, we quite frankly wouldn't find a lot of places we could serve. We think by keeping the cost of the construction down that we can make the numbers work. The numbers are looking feasible. They're not looking high profit that, you know, there's a reason that when Verizon was here, they didn't pull Fios. But we can build at a lower cost than they could, quite honestly. We, we know technology's advanced a little bit since then. So by selectively building, I think, you know, even though it's not ideal that now and then to get from A to B, you have to go around just because of the terrain, the you know, where the poles are. What we're doing really with these routes is illustrating ways we can make it work. They say these are not the order that it has to be of construction. Blue was chosen for various reasons as the first route, but beyond that, the, there's no specific order intended. Um, how much it gets built at any given time depends on how the funding comes at any given time and what the results are of the blue route and what that teaches us. The blue route really is there in effect as a pilot to determine how real life conditions compare to our predictions. All right, thank you very much. Any, any other thoughts about the uh, either the feasibility study itself or the list of suggestions that uh, the project team has put together? Is everybody ready to, to move forward and get on to the next step? Andy? Don't cheap on the core no, router. Put your, put your mic down. Don't cheap on the core router. Somebody put that in there and I was like, that's the worst mistake you could ever make is to cheat on that. That's my only two cents. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, quite frankly, that comes also down to the ISP, but we, uh, per, our, our view is once you do as little routing as possible in an access network and just hand it off to a router, but do everything in the VLAN layer in case, you know, that's the design parameter. <laughs> Sounds great. Thanks for that, Andy. Any other any other thoughts? Are you guys all ready to move forward with this? 
Okay, wow. So I was expecting a lot more discussion. That's uh, maybe that's a, a good sign. Certainly a, a, a testament to the the thoroughness of the report. So um, I'm I'm going to make a motion that we conditionally um, conditionally approve the feasibility study subject to the um, the addenda that the project team has identified, and, and that the project team will work with with Interisle to produce the final report and deliver that to the Department of Public Service. Second. second. Yeah. Okay. I think Siobhan was first on, on the second. Woohoo! I win. Yeah. You're number two. Please send me any edits, you know, things you want tweaked in the take it from draft to, to you know, to uh, released stage. Okay. Definitely, yeah. So I, I, I did send the, those those comments. I, I for some reason I thought I'd CC'd you, or I had added that um, I had added that to the email that I had last sent oh, you. Okay, from. I see, I see. They just just arrived. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so, um, okay. Any any further discussion about the feasibility study before we can sign off and then move on to the business plan, Michael? Um, in the context of our previous issue of of um, the public records request and my suggestion that we incorporate as many of these suggested changes or edits into the copy before it's sent off. I kind of want to know from Fred and Dan whether that's realistic. Um, and, and from Jeremy and Alan, whether there's any wiggle room on the three days, how it's, when you start counting it, if it, Gets turned in on the fourth day. Does that result in a lawsuit? It, it would. It would not be good. So, so what what, what I'm going to work with is I'm going to work with the current draft, not updated. So the current draft was requested, and I'm going to put that current draft together, um, or we're going to look at doing the redactions on that, and then on a separate copy, we'll look at doing some of the other updates and corrections and adding the executive summary and such, because those aren't. I mean, that was all. Uh, this is all hy hypothetical changes at this point. Yeah, they don't exist yet. We don't have those, but we right, do right. have the draft. Right. So does that does that make sense, Michael? Sure. Okay. Any other thoughts about the feasibility study? Okay. So we're going to try to do what we did um, the last time. Um, I'm going to assume that we have consensus. If we don't have consensus, then then you let me know. But um, so moving forward, as if we have consensus and that everybody is giving a positive vote for this, uh, if you have objections and are expecting that you would vote against this motion, please let me know right now. I'll give you a moment or two. Okay. Hearing no objections, I will assume that we have consensus and that we have unanimous consent for that motion to pass. So um, the feasibility study is conditionally approved, subject to the changes of the project team. Thanks, thanks everybody. Um, all right, so got to get back to my... I, I attended the NEK CUD first meeting, mm -hmm. and they had... It was their first meeting, their organizational meeting. They had a lot of things to vote on. Every single vote was a roll call vote, unanimous votes. Ouch. I am so, I am so pleased that you're doing it the way you're doing it. Yeah, because we'd be here for another hour, I think. All right. Every time you ask if there's any objections, I want to shout that the groom slept with the bride's <laughs> sister or something like that. <laughs> Uh, okay, and so, my hand would get a cramp writing down all the roll calls. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 Siobhan, I want to invite you next time we have a vote. Please, please do it at least just for the record, okay? <laughs> and, 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 Jeremy, I, I want you to make sure that that goes into the minutes. Just saying. Okay. Um, I'm looking at. Um, so let's let's postpone the approval of the previous meeting minutes unless everybody thinks that that's something that we need to do. Um, let's do a quick quick discussion of the um, update about the schedule. Is there something you wanted to talk about, David, with that? Well, I can I can roll the schedule into the topic discussion on the um, 
RDOF invitation I sent out for interest to yep. either Perfect. be an RDOF participant in a, which is on the schedule. And yep. Why don't you do I'm that? pretty close to keeping it on schedule. Um, but we sent out letters or emails to, I think, nine different potential ISP contenders or utilities for the RDOF. And we got back one, two, three, one back from VTEL, Waitsville Champlain Telecom, Cloud Alliance, Tilson Technologies, Washington Electric, Valley Net, with a contingency that they're not interested in doing any Wi Fi, and then RB Technologies, which basically, after I talked to them, they're, they're sort of going to drop out. But so I thought that was pretty good to get that many different people. And my plan next steps are to respond to the group with criteria for partnering, partnering, which I'll use the business development group to come up with, and we'll send it out to the. So the time schedule. Yeah, this one we do have to stay on task pretty quickly to stay competitive with the, the funding and, and all that. Um, not clear what we're going to do with Washington Electric. I mean, they are interested, but they are sort of still hemming and hawing about how to do it. Um, but we can talk about that later. And then the other thing is to just continue to follow the FCC's um, refinement of the numbers that go with each of the blocks. Um, I don't know when they're going to come out with their final numbers um, and see whether that how that impacts the um, the district. The end of May. The end of May. Thank you. Yes. And it's in the middle of May right now, so it's not far away. The next one is on the NBN Northern Commission, Northern Border Regional Commission um, grant application. Uh, we got. Positive feedback from the Vermont MBRC representative on our letter of interest and was encouraged to apply. I'd say the application right now is about 65% complete. We got support letters already from the town of Orange and they, the group in Cabot. Uh, support letters in progress from the town of Callis, town of Moortown, and Washington Central Unified Union School District. Contacted unknown status because I was CC'd on the request was the city of Montpelier, town of Middlesex, and town of Berlin. If the other people have notice of them happening, I don't have that information yet. But it really does help to have as many letters of support. I need to um, get the Regional Planning Commission and Jeremy. If you can get Central, it would be great. Do, do state legislators? Sorry, you go ahead. We'll take letters of support from anybody. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to contact my do? legislator. Okay. Yeah. So they just have to get them to me by you know May 29th. So other other sort of large uh, institutions. So you know, like so the the hospital in Berlin, right? I could I could reach out to them. State legislators would yeah. probably be good. But if somebody works at National Life. Um, I'm just thinking of other. Um, nope. So, so Trev, if VSCCU is willing to say, "Hey, we think this is a valuable sort of thing," and you're willing to, uh, you know, chase down the CEO or whoever would write that write that letter, um, you know, these are all things. Um, there, there is a there is a value in in volume in this in this uh, in yeah. this case, I believe. And I'll try to get Capstone. I just thought about getting Capstone. I know Sue meant it pretty well. Great. Um, so. And there's a and, and David sent out a while ago. He sent out a, a draft, sort of a template letter that you can use. They certainly don't have to follow that, but the idea is that they're they're going to explain, um, you know, their institutional or their personal support for uh, what we're trying to do. And it makes us it, it demonstrates that we're connected to our community. Um, so yeah. the the other, the other connection with your select board, by the way, if I'm not mistaken, we're all supposed to be reappointed this month. Right. Yeah. So you should be reaching out <laughs> so to select, an opportunity. select boards I, and city I, councils. I, I met with Calus Select Board last night, and um, they really appreciate being kept in the in the loop. They let me know how much they hated the VTEL tower that got knocked down in Calus. So in terms of tall towers, be careful. Um, anyway, so they were really supportive. So I feel good about it. How tall was that tower? 150 feet. Pretty big. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on this, David? No. Okay. Any questions for David? Those are my notes. Okay. 
Great. So you all have some marching orders. If you have organizations that you know of or your select boards, if you did not hear your town mentioned in that in that list, it would be great to um, to do that bit of outreach if you if you could. All right. Um, so let's move on to a commentary about the Vermont Emergency Broadband Action Plan. What we'd like to be able to do <laughs> is respond to the Department of Public Service who have put together this um, pretty ambitious uh, broadband action plan um, looking to do, uh, well, it's looking to do a lot of things right now. And if you watch the, le the legislature discuss it today, um, there's a lot of different directions that, that it went. And there was a bit of, and I think fairly a bit of confusion about what was trying to be accomplished. Um, and so that, that discussion got off to a bit of a slow start because people were not clear what they were actually trying to achieve. But what I think I would like for us to do, because there is a commentary uh, window open for us to say, here's here are the good things, here are the bad things about this. Um, we have an opportunity to to shape this, and it's like I think, like I said earlier on, this is being taken very seriously at the state level now. Everybody is uh, everybody has their eyes on broadband. So um, if I could. Let me just get us started. I'm going to see if I can find my um, commentary that I sent sort of uh, informally to Rob Fish. And where did that go? That was this morning because I remember, David, you uh, you also had a commentary. Okay. So um, one of the things that the um, that this plan uh, – think it considers is giving funding to CUDs directly to support administrative tasks. So what I said is I said, you know, it would be great if we had funding to have an executive director. We've had this conversation before. Ray, I remember you mentioning this over and over. That has landed there. It is at DPS. The legislature's heard it. They are supportive, and it sounds like they will be willing to fund it in some form. So I said, get, you know, administrative tasks like, you know, bookkeeping, grant management, fundraising, grant writing, minute taking, um, you know, uh, dealing with some of the some of the mapping stuff. So it's, it's great that we have David on board here, but there's not a David in every communications union district. And David's not going to do that work for every communications union district, I suspect. Maybe, maybe, maybe you will, but <laughs> at, at, at some point you will actually, <laughs> you, you may actually want to retire, just saying. Um, so, so what I said is I said it's um, having someone whose full-time job it is to manage these kind of day-to-day -day things would make us much more efficient and less likely for things to fall through the cracks. Like, I didn't send the thing to Fred before tonight, I, and I should have. You know, I didn't have meetings with the treasurer, and I should have, um, and I totally own that. Um, so moving on. Um, the the question about how grant so this is more of a um, a federal level thing so I don't know if that actually makes sense for as a commentary about this plan um, the the plan uh, proposes to take a whole big pot of money and essentially get any address which is not 253 or more right now get any address that's not 253 or more to 100 100 minimum. And using a reverse auction process um, like RDOF. So it's ex ex explicitly carving around the places that have cable or fiber and that RDOF is not covering. So the idea is that we would go into this, this auction process alongside going into the RDOF process. And, and what I said is that this is still, it's a really awkward process for us to get involved in. It'd be better if there was some sort of if there was a town by town block grant and you wanted to contract with us to just build it, so let's just do that rather than having this much more complicated uh, situation. And there, um, um, that was that was proposed. That Rob mentioned that to the legislature today, and again, they didn't run screaming. It seemed like a like a reasonable, um, reasonable thing. Um, the example that that I used was the way that education, um, primary and secondary education, is delivered in the state of Vermont. So we have the education fund in the state of Vermont, and then the state writes checks out of that fund to the individual school districts to deliver education subject to certain criteria. 
and I could see there being a broadband fund, hey, we have one, um, uh, where that those checks would be written to providers to deliver the service in the same sort of way. So we have a structure that already does this sort of delivery of a public good. And I think um, this is something that would be a, a cleaner way of um, getting the fiber off the ground here. Um, I mentioned a asking for some clarification, um, not necessarily a new law, but maybe some um, better, um, better explicit um, language in the public records law to ensure that we don't have any confusion about whether or not we can mark things um, not public when they are um, competitive materials. So I, th I, I think that the current statute supports what we're trying to do. I just think it would be good to have something maybe slightly more explicit so that it's not likely to be challenged in court. Um, and then I said, obviously, you know, this all boils down to us getting access to capital and fulfilling our mission of getting everybody in our, you know, 18 towns, getting them actual real, you know, 21st century access. Um, and then David, I don't know if you want to read your, your suggestions. Uh, or if you want me to, to do them, I'm, I can happily. If you have them right there. Sure, I do. So um, um, David asked uh, to, uh, about developing a generic website specifically for um, specifically for CUDs, and it turns out that 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 website actually exists. There's some um, challenge to getting things onto a state website, so it's slow, and especially now, things are slightly slightly slower. But there is a sort of a CUD um, uh, page kind of nestled within the DPS's website. Yeah. With a billing, with a billing system and a community and a, all of that? I uh, doubt that. I didn't see a billing oh. system mentioned in your comments. No, but I mean, to me, a website is to manage the whole site, it's sort of like East. Oh, 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 okay. So, like, so, like a a, a template website that each each CMT yeah. could use. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Anyway, so, I, so, it should so, have been more explanatory. Yeah, yeah. That was, uh, yeah, because Rob's like, well, we have that, and I guess no, we don't. So, so let's, yeah, let's make sure that that gets added to the list as well. Uh, ready access to the locations of all fiber networks in the state. There's a start of that but there's some of that information that's sensitive that's not likely to um, to get out there either. Yeah. Um, creation of decent GIS mapping of cell Wi-Fi coverage. Um, so Corey could go around and maybe get more granular data. Is that what you're hoping for, David? Yeah, and basically know where it all is. I mean, we, we're, we're, we're in the dark. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then good inventory of poles and towers and the things that are on the poles. Um, um, Rob had a question about this and he said, but wouldn't the engineers that go and do any particular project then need to go and do another um, poll audit and actually physically sign off on it themselves though? Well, if it was done right to begin with, you wouldn't have to. <laughs> okay, and, and that's and that was that was kind of my response to him too. I mean, if we yeah. got it done by an engineer, then they signed off on it, presumably. Correct. Another mm -hmm. engineer would be able to come and say, "Oh, yeah, okay, he he did this. I'm going to incorporate this." So, um, does Dan, so, you know, would that count for them for the survey? Pardon? For the make ready? Because there is in in our plan, there's a there is a per poll charge, a per poll cost, right? For the yeah. pre you know, for the for the survey, would who who has to pick the person? So yeah, so so this Dan, is so this Dan, is. Oh, go ahead. That's the open question. Would 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 it be somebody you would use, or would, would this have to be someone? Well, in, in the context of this emergency plan, I was suggesting why don't they spend some money and do this work that we wouldn't have to pay for? So have the state. I, I was trying to find us. ways that we would. That would be that would be nice. <laughs> Could I answer that? So, so that's all about make ready, and and the utility the poll owners are the ones who control what happens to their polls whether they're overloaded, whether there's cables that are getting too close to power lines. And, and it, there is this one touch version that's going into the um, little 3.7, which controls pole attachments in Vermont. 
but it, it, it it's not something for the department or for us to do because the poll owners are ultimately liable for how things are done on their own polls and whether they'll fall down and whether whether someone will get electrocuted and that's the reason that they're the ones who charge the survey fee right. for a poll okay okay so if we get back to um the commentary about the Vermont Emergency Broadband Action Plan, are there any other things that you think that we need to include in a message from from us, from CV Fiber, um, in that plan? Or if there are any of those things that I mentioned or that David mentioned that should not be in our response? Well, so this is my, I mean, I haven't written too many comments on this thing other than what I suggested to Rob today. But the one of is, a reverse auction I'm totally opposed to, but the fact that they think it's a great idea to tie it with the FCC's um, reverse auction makes no sense because they are not going to have this money until 2021, and the reverse auction is happening now. Mm -hmm. So it it didn't make it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know, Michael. What do you think? Um, no, I think it does make sense. Um, okay, but but I think that this my recommendation is that the that the CUDs get the block grants. Okay. Because the legislature yep. and the department are clearly favoring CUDs right now. Yeah. Okay. That may not always be true, but it is now. And we take advantage of that and urge them to give block grants to CUDs. And that eliminates this weird issue of having a reverse auction, someone having the lowest bid, and then the CUDs having veto power over it. I, I, I don't understand how they thought that would fly. Um, so if we have a block grant and we can choose our provider, I think that's a better system. And then the rest of the state could be reverse auctioned because it's going to be hard to get someone to cover those towns. Yeah. And if they're grouped in not just towns, but as counties or regional planning commission units, which is what they proposed in their plan, um, they will force whoever wants to do Dover to do three other towns next to Dover. And that way it happens. And so that makes sense. And then on top of that, uh, the question about RDOF and, and this and, and timing, um, the RDOF money will not be distributed for at least a year after the auction. The RDOF auction is gonna take place this October, but the whole legal process with the FCC takes about a year after you know. and so the state and and then you have and you have six years from the day you get money to get to complete your build out the state is proposing a build out within three years of getting money or getting the award which i think is overly optimistic but <laughs> probably appropriate in this, this political time and then but that, you can that's grant money not loan money right well that's the big difference because and, and, and caf is the problem with ardoff and caf is that those are 10-year operating grants intended to pay off loans right. uh, which is different from a grant so th they're they are based around the model that a rural telephone company will get cheap loans from the department of agriculture and pay it back with the the uh, caf or ardoff money that's not you know, the model here. So it's very tricky to try and coordinate the two things. RDOF is only 17,000 estimated locations in the state. Um, so it, it doesn't pick up. Right now, but... Oh, is up to 24? Yeah. But, it, but, but still, it's, you know, it's a significant part of some of these towns. Um, and it also excludes some of these towns in, in the district too, uh, including some of the most needy towns. Roxbury is excluded because it's TDS and TDS is, uh, areas are not covered by RDOF, for instance. So, um, the, the, or Roxbury. Well, Sorry, what Roxbury. is TDS? Huh? They're a cable company. Well, so, TDS is Northfield Telephone Company. Okay. So, I just want to say this plan, if you haven't had a chance to read it, was it's sort of advertised as to take care of the current emergency in the next six to eight months. And there's almost nothing in it, as far as I was concerned, that takes care of the next six to eight months um they you know there's not a lot of information about how to deal with temporary wi-fi or how they get it around and i'm just saying that we is the department 
using this as an excuse not to do a, a full-blown plan about how they ought to deal with telecom in the state. Yeah. And this is the latest that. Ken, go ahead. Um, day. Ken. So yeah, I want to put this in context of the money. Um, I, I do think it's inappropriately labeled the emergency broadband action plan um, because the money that they're focusing on is speculative money that Peter Welch is talking about in terms of an infrastructure um, investment that has not been passed by Congress. There are two other pots of money um, that are that exist today, and June brought up a little bit of it. And, and when she talks about CARES money, there's uh, some small pots that are directed towards education and telehealth. That money exists, um, or was passed by Congress, but it, those are relatively small pots. The much bigger pot of money that exists today is the state of Vermont was provided $1.25 billion. Um, the COVID response program, the COVID response something. Um, and it is up to the agencies to determine how to spend that $1.25 billion. And so there is reasonable proposal that is just a number of millions of dollars that is to be used during calendar 2020. And so I would, I think we will be seeing another emergency plan because as David said, this plan is really for the future. It's appropriate to think about, think about how to get fiber to everybody but it's not gonna be using money in 2020. It's gonna be using money in the future. To the extent we can think about it now and set ourselves up and set the CUDs up to be able to move forward on that over the 2021 to 2024 period makes sense. But, but the emergency situation, getting broadband to our students, getting broadbands to patients that need telehealth and getting a broadband to remote workers who are not able to go to work this year is another emergency plan. And I think we'll be seeing something in the next couple of weeks because that money has to be spent in 2020 and is not characterized by what EBAP represents. And, and I, I've spoken to a couple people in the department, they recognize that and they will be looking for that next emergency plan. And that, this next emergency plan though has great questions for us. How would CUDs act in a very short time frame? to identify how best to use that money to get service. It may not be 100 hundred service this year because we can't string fiber that fast, but is there a role for CUDs to help move that truly emergency action forward? That's gonna be a question that we're gonna to need to think about because I say in the next couple of weeks, four weeks, I think we're gonna see another emergency plan. Thanks for that, Ken. Um, I have a, a couple other things that, that came to mind, um, both from um, the presentation to the legislature today. Um, yeah, mainly from that. Um, the idea of a coalition of CUDs um, so that you know, we in EC Fiber and the Northeast Kingdom, and the two in the South, and there's one nascent one in Lamoille County and so on and so on. Wouldn't it be nice if we could all get together and sort of kind of go after some of these pots of money altogether as a coalition. And that's um, that's something else that I think would probably be valuable to to call out in our commentary to the um, to this uh, emergency plan is, you know, maybe CUDs need funding, but is there is there funding for a, you know, a super CUD, a statewide entity that would contain all of the CUDs in it as well? And is, could there be, um, some administrative um, overhead that's managed by that as well. I, I know we sort of mentioned this, gosh, this was what, four months ago that somebody, maybe it was me, sar somebody sarcastically mentioned, you know, do we need a district of districts? And I think um, that's kind of kind of on the table now, frankly. Um, and specifically with the one that's up in uh, Lamoille County, there's a uh, there's an effort, apparently it's in GovOps right now, to fast track new CUDs because Right, so to get a CUD, you have to have a vote at town meeting. Well, what do we not want to have people doing right now? Going to town meeting. Um, so there's some towns in Lamoille County that want to start their own CUD, but they don't want to have to go through uh, the town meeting process. So it looks like there may be a fast track process for 
new CUDs. So we may see before long um, a CUD covering basically every town in the state. Um, I don't. I don't know how much we will have a role in that process, but I think it's it would be important for us to be um, advocating for or against it or otherwise, you know, mentioning it in our commentary about the uh, about the plan. So, Michael. So in the RDOF process, there is um, something called consortia, where we could form a, form a consortium with the other other CUDs that wanted to participate and bid on mass through one eligible bidder as part of that consortium. Um, and we don't have to only think about RDOF. It's just it's the biggest problem really that we're going to see probably in 10 years unless unless the wealthy bill gets bigger. Um, so it, it's certainly worth continuing to think about. And, and our bidding power is improved as we ally with other entities, I would think. Um, it, it, could, it could introduce some problems too as to how to divvy it up and who's the lead and who's responsible and who's letter of credit and all that. Of course, then, then there's the, the aspect of the emergency plan where they proposed that the beta cover letters of credit for CUDs. Um, that would be a, a really wonderful thing too. Okay, so what I'm what I'm hoping to do is have have this letter go out to DPS about the emergency broadband action plan. They have the, the commentary period is is over on the 20, 29th, I think. Six. 26th. Okay. And there's so, going to be a public meeting prior to that. Right. And that's uh, what, next, a week from Thursday, I think? Did I write that down? Right? Five, the 21st, there will be a public meeting about this. Um, so what I'd like to get authorization from, from the board to do is to draft that letter with the commentary that, that you heard tonight um, on behalf of CV Fiber and get that to the um, – Get that to the to the department. Any thoughts or objections or anything about that? I could probably add to it, but I, I, I've I've got a uh, a marked up copy here. There's lots of little things that I don't think the board needs to be dragged through. But I could help. <laughs> I could add that stuff for you. Sure. So so we so we I think we went through this process before. Uh, what, what was the pro? What was the commentary that we put up, Michael, where CV Fiber had some commentary and then you as Kingdom Fiber did? It was during the, um, it was during the uh, department RFP process. We, there was a question period at the beginning of how, of how, this, how the program would work and how, how the application process worked, and, and we, did, we collaborated on the questions. Okay. So um, I guess I'll I'll just make a motion. Um, I move that the um, the board authorizes me to write a letter uh, on behalf of CV Fiber to comment on the the Vermont Emergency, emergency Broadband Action Plan with the previously noted uh, items that we've that we brought up in this meeting. Second. Okay. Who was that second? Phil. Okay, thanks, Phil. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, I'm going to assume that we have uh, unanimous consent unless I hear any objections. Give a minute or so. While we're waiting, Jeremy, so who was that going to be sent to? Was that the legislature or? To the, I'm sorry, I'm to, writing too slow. To the de Department of Public Service, it's it was their it was their plan, so they are they are soliciting comments on it right now. Thanks. And I thought us as a board, we would have uh, a bit of influence there, anyways. Okay, not hearing any objections, I will assume that we have unanimous consent and the motion passes. Thank you, everybody. Um, let's do a.
uh, let's do a round table if we can, and then we'll then we'll be done. Uh, Alan, uh, approval of minutes. That's on the uh, agenda, or are we leaving that until later? Let's let, let's leave that till till the next meeting. Although although um, do we need to have another meeting this month? Do we need to have our our, our uh, meeting in two weeks, David? Um, in terms of submitting the application to the Northern Board of Regional Commission, um, you need to be authorized to submit the application. I think. Okay, I think so, that, so 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 let's so what, when does that have to be in? That's to be in June first. June first, yeah. Okay, so so let's you know what I I think it's worthwhile, and there's going to be enough stuff coming down the pike. I think it's worthwhile looking at uh, May twenty sixth as a a meeting basically to talk about the Northern Borders Grant. Is there, are there any objections to that? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna put that on our schedule then for the 26th. Okay, um, anything else? Do we, need, do, we need, do we need to talk about the grant or, or have we already agreed that we wanna apply and, and we can authorize David and the committee to submit the application? make a motion and do it uh, so, well because we we don't have a, a warrant agenda item and that seems like an important enough thing to have as a warrant agenda item i mean the the, okay. the, meet, the meeting wouldn't have to be terribly long it could be this it could be five or ten minutes yeah. if we have discussion i just think it, it it makes sense to have that as a clear warrant agenda item okay. Thank you. yeah okay so let's get, so any anything else about this before we move on to Okay, Alan. Yeah, these are <clears throat> these have become sort of amazing meetings. I think you know first for the for the format of doing it online, but it's it's uh, really interesting to see a huge challenge that has been in front of people for a long time, building out broadband into rural areas, and to see what could be a resolution coming together so quickly is uh, it doesn't happen very often. So it's uh, it's really it's really amazing to be part of it. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Andy? Um, pretty good. Just thank you to everybody and let's keep going. All right. Chuck? I would just like to say a big thank you to Fred and Dan for uh, the work they put into that report. I was thoroughly impressed with uh, how detailed it was and and the thought process and the approach and and uh, I want to thank you for uh, for what you've done because uh, this is going to open up a lot of doors for us I think yeah definitely echo that and uh, at least alphabetically I, I I know you're not on the board but uh, Dan and Fred do you have anything that you you guys would like to add at this moment Nothing particular. I appreciate the chance to work with you guys and hope we can continue to, to be helpful and uh, hope that, you know, the business plan part um, works out well. All right. Thank you very much. Well, I'll just echo that. <laughs> okay. David? Uh, I just, uh, well, I want the great work from Dan and Fred. Um, the other thing I just want to put in everybody's mind is, you know, this pandemic is going to result in a lot of other things happening in the next couple of years. Broadband is a big one of it. But I also think universal access is going to be, you know, where, oh, we got a take rate of 50%. Well, I can see a day when the take rate's 100% because everybody needs it. So how it gets funded is another story. <laughs> All right, uh, Greg. Uh, well, a uh, big thanks to the inter aisle folks and especially to David for guiding this. and. Thanks for all your work on it. Thanks, Greg. Jeremy? Yeah, uh, not a whole lot, but again, was really impressed with the report. Thank you very much, uh, Dan and Fred, and uh, to everyone else who's put tons and tons of work into this. All right, Jerry? Nothing to add. Thank you all. Thanks, Jerry. John? Uh, I agree with what uh, Alan said that there uh, there seems to be a lot more momentum than it was a, a year ago. Um, I think it's all due to the people on the board here and and events. 
And I also want to thank Dan and uh, Fred for what I think is, uh, uh, even in its uh, uh, form now, an excellent report that uh, gives us a great deal of hope that we can actually uh, um, succeed. Um, I don't know if a year ago we all would have uh, imagined that we would have uh, this uh, um, a really good report from Dan and Fred. That, that uh, so I, I think that a lot of work has gone into this, and there's still a lot of work to do. Um, and um, and one more thing, I, I uh, due to uh, Jeremy Hansen uh, sending me a note, I did watch the uh, the two committees uh, sort of struggling uh, with uh, with. But, well, they were struggling with doing with what we're doing. Um, um, but we, we're doing a much better job than those two committees did. Um, um, it's for me that you had a lot of uh, a lot of discussion with uh, with uh, Mr. Fish and uh, and David, I guess, also. Um, but there's still an incredible amount of work to do here. And and I think that we we put our foot down on the path and we're going in the right direction. So thanks for putting up with my speech and uh, now I'm done. Thanks, John. Josh? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to echo everyone's thanks and, and that's it, I won't take up any more time. Okay, Ken? Yeah, I, I'm gonna put mine in the form of a question. I, I had to duck out for a couple minutes. Um, so by approving the feasibility study with some changes. Does that mean it goes to the public service department? Yes. Okay, that because that's what I want to make sure we get done as quickly as possible, um, part by wearing my state hat um, to see what it is their expectations are, and we'll get that feedback, and that'll be really helpful. Okay. Michael? Well, I just want to say that despite the fact that they work for this enormous faceless national corporation fred and dan have been so personal and so detail oriented and so helpful to us it's a, it's a great pleasure to work with them thank you all right uh siobhan so ken you got a hat i didn't get a hat <laughs> when did you get a state hat <laughs> That's not fair. I'm ready to grab a shovel and a ladder, so let's do this. And um, was, oh yeah, the other thing I wanted to say is what would it take to get internet finally declared a utility for the public good? What What's that gonna take? And can the state do it for the Vermont? Or does that have to be well, a federal well, thing? Well, well, quite honestly, let's talk about, t I wanna address for one minute, because that's an interesting question. The internet itself is not a thing, it's a phenomenon and you shouldn't treat it as a thing. Um, people misunderstand it. The, and so it's not a utility, it's information. And information is not a utility. The physical network, the fiber, should be a utility. That's the thing that people, the idea of vertical integration, which was done in the um, early 2000s, the FCC flouted the letter of the law, if you actually read Title II. Um, they flouted the letter of the law and created vertical integration of broadband providers when the law was intended to have a utility provide the wire and basic transport service that would enable competitive internet to run on top of it. So really what you want, you know, the best way to fund you, fiber is as a utility that's open to everyone uh, to use as long as they pay the price. Um, because that way the externalities are captured by the users but the utility still makes its money and yeah. you have one and you don't have 18 different people extending the phone poles to string fiber you it, it's a crazy model that the us adopted and it was basically done in order to kill the competition because the fcc knew nobody could afford to overbuild verizon and at&t right so so how do we change that that's my question. I want, well, I want to fix that. There's two things. One is we have to change the regime in Washington at the FCC. And then... So harder, it is a federal thing. It's federal. It's all federal yeah, policy. Okay. And also we have to convince the people who were, who should have been on our side to stop fighting for network neutrality, which they defined as regulating the internet, and fight for open networks 
and to just have utility fiber structural separation is the term which which completely all the people arguing that the entire obama administration wasting their time on a dead end and not making the progress they should have made so we've got to redirect the polity to think about the problem as a utility at the bottom layer and then free and open competition for the use of the fiber and that was totally ignored by people who thought that the internet itself was the utility and that you should regulate it but if you actually know how the internet works it's an abomination technically and we need to <laughs> fix it technically which you can't do if that's the utility i'm sorry i wound you up <laughs> i mean okay. i appreciate okay. the answer this is my, I did, but uh, i didn't my want business. to upset you i i didn't telecom, i didn't mean to upset you telecom policy is the heart of my business and so that's yeah. why you know yeah, we, but no, I appreciate the detail because right. I will be more precise in the future when I. But that's when a good I question. But I, you know, actually, the state of Vermont probably would agree with me on this, and if they could, they would. Maybe we should convince them to try and push to push it. I think you're probably right. I think okay. you would all you would also find a friend in Peter Welch. I think he would could also agree with that. But let's move on to Phil. <laughs> follow that i think it's all been said for tonight so i'm <laughs> i'm good all right uh ray yeah so um i think you know, this uh, coronavirus has created a moment it has accelerated uh, some trends that were ongoing uh, we reached some tipping points and some things uh, it has also underscored um, some social infrastructure issues that we've had for a long time but it's provided a moment for us. I think it's going to result in a lot of grant money. Uh, we in this country through rural electrification initiatives, and now we need a rural metrification initiative with all kinds of grant money. I think we're going to start seeing that come together. That's it. All right. Thanks, Ray. Uh, Steve, anything you want to add? Steve Harris on the phone. Okay. Nope. There you um, are. No, I, I, re I really don't. The only thing I would add, do you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Oh, okay. Uh, the only, the only thing I, I would add is that, you know, I noticed in the emergency uh, broadband action plan, they were considering the exception to the 100, 100 MBPS right. uh, rule. And I think that's significant and hopefully they'll carry that over into the next phase of the plan that you're you're talking about okay that's that's a that's a really that's good point it. cool thank you very much uh tom yeah uh, i'm again thankful for uh, the feasibility study and good to finally see it after you know a couple of years of slogging through here and been talking about it for a while so um, i'm looking forward to the business plan and and all of the latest you know talk at the state level um is is pretty interesting as far as you know, we've been talking about well what would the the rates be to our customers um based on the idea of needing to get enough money in so we can continue to build the network out and if if that starts to drop off as the the metric of how we build then it becomes you know some more interesting blue sky territory of of um what do we start charging people and, and what does that look like and how low can we get the prices to be so yeah i'm really excited to see what's coming down the pike All right. Thanks, Tom. And uh, just uh, Phil just said he had to drop out. And then uh, Trev said uh, in the chat, thank you for the meeting this evening, the report, and of course the conversations and decisions around the draft and associated requests for information. For me, work calls at the moment. I must simply drop off the meeting. Thank you all. And uh, so I'm going to uh, move that we adjourn. Second. Okay. So, all right, great. And so we are. Okay. We are adjourned. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.